from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the African Middle East Division. I'm Mary Jane Deeb. I'm the chief of the division, and I'm delighted to host you today for a program organized by Laverne Page, Africa Specialist in this division, and the Library of Congress Organization of Employees with Disabilities. In a few moments, we will also have Kirk Rasko, Director of the Office of Opportunity, Inclusiveness, and Compliance, who will be making remarks in recognition of National Disability Employment Awareness Month. But now a few words about this division. As many of you already know, it is made up of three sections, the African, the Near East, and the Hebraic sections. We are responsible for materials from 78 different countries uh, in the Near East, Central Asia, the Caucasus, the entire continent of Africa, North and Sub-Sahara, and our Hebraica and Judaica collections come from all over the world. We also serve these materials to patrons here in our reading room and organize programs, exhibits, conferences, and other activities that highlight these collections and that inform our patrons about the countries and the cultures these publications come from. Our presentation today is a case in point. We have with us Dr. Woli Mabombo Tata, the Executive Director of Library Services at the University of South Africa, who will speak about a subject that we have not discussed in this forum before, namely on disability awareness in South Africa and the lessons we can learn from the services provided by the University of South Africa, which is headquartered in Pretoria. South Africa is a rich and complex country about which we are learning more every day. Last year, the African Middle East Division's Africa section, in partnership with the Poetry and Literature Center and the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa, launched a new series called Conversations with African Poets and Writers. The series consists of a set of live webcast interviews with established and emerging poets short story writers, novelists, and playwrights from the African continent and the African diaspora. Programs include readings and are moderate and moderated discussions led by staff in the African section of the library's division. Last week, we had a writer and poet from South Africa, Mandela Kaisi Machumza, who read to us from one of his works in Hosa, one of the 11 official languages of South Africa. And in April, we hosted a program in the series featuring the poet laureate of South Africa, Keora Petsi Kegositsil. So we always want to learn more and to have the experts, the specialists, come and inform us and let us know what is happening in South Africa. So now let me pass the microphone to Kirk Rasko, who joins me in welcoming Dr. Mabambo Tata to the Library of Congress. So, Kirk, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Hold the applause down to a manageable roar. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Mambo Tata. She's the only one. Welcome to the United States. Welcome to the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and welcome to the Library of Congress. I am the Director of Opportunity, Inclusiveness, and Compliance for the Library of Congress, and I was reminded by Ms. D, is it Ms. D or Dr. Dr. D, okay, the doctor's in the house, that I was a relative newcomer, like an uh, electron spun off of a, an atom in a nanosecond, and I've been here for four months. But I also reminded her that in time, everything is relative as Einstein said. So even the oldest structure, there's something older. And even the youngest one, there's always something younger. So with that in mind, I wanted, I wanted to welcome you to the library. 
And just to let you know that here at the library, we have a workforce of about 3,500 employees. Uh, as of April 2012, we took a survey and we found that 246, almost 250, self-identified as having a disability. The largest group of those who self-identified having a disability, namely 63 individuals, did not wish to officially disclose their disability. So whatever strides we have made in this country, in this city, in this institution, individuals still are not entirely comfortable with disclosing their disability. We also have had recent changes to the law which have broadened the definition of disabled so that individuals with conditions such as diabetes, epilepsy, arthritis are now included within that definition. And I know from just uh, anecdotal experience that some individuals with hidden disabilities would prefer that they remain hidden. Having said that, the library does value diversity and we seek to leverage the diversity that we have in our workforce. Easier said than done. And, and one of the reasons it's easier said than done is that diversity means different things to different people. Um, but here, <clears throat> we seek to use diversity to enhance our core values, which are service, stewardship, excellence, and collaboration. So in that regard, is that it is important that the library supervisors, managers, um, librarians, the custodians of our national culture and heritage um, demonstrate behavior and values that promote inclusiveness, including, including the inclusiveness of individuals with disabilities. Sometimes it's hard to do that when you don't know whether or not a person has a disability, but that underscores the need for mutual respect in uh, our nation's uh, valued institutions. Um, but we have identified inclusiveness here at the library as one of the core competencies for our managers. So I just, I'm not gonna take up the whole program. I could go on and on about the Library of Congress. I've never been here in this august room before. Um, I think it's beautiful. Um, I look forward to hearing your presentation because one of the things that we've learned from uh, Amanda Donaldson, who's sitting behind you, she's the President, Amanda, Vice Chair of our Organization of Employees with Disabilities, is that culture affects the way in which disabilities are perceived and interacted with in society. And I don't know about in South Africa, but there are Americas made up of different cultures, just similar, similar to yours. And in some of those cultures, individuals with disabilities were segregated for a long period of time, hidden away so that no one could see them, not spoken of and not spoken to. We've had individuals with disabilities tell us, for instance, an individual who, who is blind, say that <clears throat> when he goes to the store with someone who's sighted, they will give his change to the sighted person. They will talk to the sighted person. And the same thing happens with individuals who have hearing impairments. So culture affects the way we interact. But the good news is we're in a position to affect the changes in our culture. And I think the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, has gone a long way towards changing the cultural expectations and cultural norms that we engage when we engage with individuals with disabilities. The other good news is the young people of today grew up in an inclusive environment because parents, caretakers, and other stakeholders fought for full inclusion for school children some 20 years ago. 
So we have an entire generation of young people who don't understand what the big deal is with including people with disabilities, and it's the older people like myself who have the difficulty, simply because we have not been acculturated to include, to accept, and to respect. So having said all that, I want to thank you for having me. I want to welcome you to the library, and I look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Laverne Page. I'm an area specialist in the African and Middle Eastern Division, and I work with Southern African countries. And I would like to add my welcome to you for coming today to, today, to today's lecture in the African and Middle Eastern Division in recognition of National Disability Employment Awareness Month. We are pleased to have someone with us today who is knowledgeable about disability awareness in one of the regions covered by this division. And as Mary Jane said, we've never had a speaker before to talk about this. And therefore, Dr. Mbambo Tata's talk, her lecture, will be enlightening for us. Before I introduce her, I would like to acknowledge and to thank our co-sponsor, the Library of Congress Organization of Employees with Disabilities. This is a staff organization that started in 2007 as a brown bag lunch group. Employees met to discuss and to address issues of common concern relating to disability and accessibility. Since 2009, OED functions as a recognized LC staff organization with over 130 members. They meet during their lunch break and not only provide strength, cohesion, and social welfare for each other, but also bring that strength and cohesion to the library itself. Their mission is to assist those with present and future disabilities, to have a clearinghouse for information on workplace accommodations, universal design, programs, and services at the Library of Congress. So I'd like to acknowledge the OED Executive Board, and I know that the chair is not here today, but the vice chair, Amanda Donaldson, is, and do you want to? Well, we know who you are. <laughs> and now, on to the good part. I would like to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Mbambo Tata, Dr. Buhle Mbambo Tata. I just learned how to pronounce it correctly <laughs> this morning. She is the executive director of library services at the University of South Africa, commonly called UNISA. Prior to that, she served as university librarian at the University of Zimbabwe in Harare, Zimbabwe, a country to the north of South Africa, as many of you know. In addition to her role at UNISA, Dr. Mbambotata is active in IFLA, that's the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. She is currently a member of the IFLA Governing Board, having previously served in numerous other IFLA structures. She is a member of the Strategic Advisory Network of the Global Libraries Program of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She has previously served on various committee affiliations, including the Library Network of the Association of Commonwealth Libraries, the E-Knowledge Society for Women in Southern Africa, of which she was chairperson, the advisory committees of EIFLfound.net, the Gender in Africa Information Network, and the Access to Learning Award of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Her research interests are women and ICT, 
ICT applications in libraries and library services for mobile devices. And so now, Dr. Buchle Mbambo Tata. Colleagues, good morning. I'd like to acknowledge um, Mary Jane D, the Chief Librarian of the African and Middle Eastern Division, and the co-sponsor of this event, um, uh, Kirk Rasko, from the Opportunity Inclusiveness and Compliance, uh, and uh, Deputy President um, there of the Organization for People with, Living with Disabilities. Great appreciation to Levine Page, who after many years of conversation and meeting her, knowing her at IFLA, we finally agreed on this. I'll, I'm not disappearing, I'm just making sure I've got my cards. Um, agreed that next time I I'm in LA um, to, to come and share what we do at UNISA around, um, around uh, delivering services largely to students living with disabilities. For us in, 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 in South Africa, um, with the post-apartheid, or the apartheid history, after 1994, the country focused a great deal on inclusiveness because of many, many years of exclusiveness. And so you'll find that the philosophy of exclusive inclusiveness permeated many sectors, many professions. But in education, it was even greatest because it, education was seen as a tool uh, that would build the future generation and more inclusivity. And so there was a greater focus uh, within the education sector to, 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 to build programs um, for inclusion. And uh, in my university, um, we, we've taken that um, uh, in a great deal. The, the, the outline of my presentation is uh, typical that, you know, I'll talk a little bit about of our context, but our background will be largely what is our national context, what informs what we do, and then I'll talk about the vision and the mission of my university, and then spend a little bit of time or most of my time talking about the services that we offer to students with disabilities. I don't know about here, but in, in South Africa, uh, uh, people that are living with disabilities have made a statement very known uh, to all of us that it's nothing for us without us. And saying that we shouldn't be speaking on their behalf um, but rather we should repeat what they have said. And so in terms of defining what services and defining what interventions, the cue is taken from people living with disabilities. And in our context too, I was going through the list last night, uh, wondering if I should put a slide indicating what is defined as disabilities, and I thought I'll need 17 slides to do that because the list has increased. It's gone beyond hearing impaired and sight impaired and, and, and people in wheelchairs, but includes uh, diabetes as well, um, high blood pressure, diseases that impair your full development. So chronic, many chronic diseases are, are, are in there. And so it's become less obvious to recognize who is disabled. And the notion of identifying and responding becomes a little more challenging. In my country, as you know, we have 11 official languages. But outside the 11 official languages, there's about five other nationalities, minorities, that are not included in those 15 languages. And so the cultures of those smaller, smaller communities are not in the mainstream. One of the main languages spoken in South Africa is Isi Zulu. 
and a dialect of that, um, uh, were related, I shouldn't say a dialect because that sounds like uh, Zulu is the supreme, but other related languages, the Nguni family is Swati and Isindebel. And the word for people with disabilities is Isilima. But that word itself says there is something wrong with you. you you are out of the norm. And because you are defined like that, you then are looked down on. And one of the things that government has uh, sought a great deal to do is to put in place legislation and government intervention, interventions that will provide an, a legal instrument within which then uh, cultural practices can be subsumed. Two years ago, when the government was reshuffled, a, a ministry called Women, Children and People with Disabilities was created. And it was felt that it's important to have a full department that looks at issues of people living with disabilities, but putting together the issues um, that have to do with women and children. And it's almost really putting a, a department to look at groups that have been disadvantaged. And those three were lumped together. And being led by a very able minister, uh, Minister Tandy. Um, and in that, a group that was called previously a pressure group called the Office on the Status of Disabled Persons, or SDP, was then subsumed uh, and became a department of the ministry, other than it just being a pressure group. And that group then advises the minister on terms um, that are appropriate for use in the different languages. So that is a cultural inclusion. And the derogatory terms like Isilim are then replaced. And the easy word for people living with disabilities in Zulu is Isikoka. And, and that word is itself a, a, a word that, that does not demean a person living with disabilities. But the commonly used one was Isilim because, it, as we say in sociology, we, people generally like to exclude, because then if you exclude, maybe you'll have more resources for your group. But the word isigoga is seldom used, but it describes the same kind of person. And so this, this department is focusing on definition of terms that are, are inclusive and that ensure inclusion in all the different languages. Within the higher education sector, we have a committee of, of vice chancellors uh, in, uh, who meet around, around a body called Higher Education South Africa. And in that group, there is a group for uh, uh, people that are living with disabilities, Higher Education Disability Services Association, that is affiliated with HESA to ensure that in higher education, people living with disabilities have a voice. And that is important, again, because in South Africa we see education as a critical vehicle for uh, uh, undoing the imbalances of the past, opening up opportunities of the people, and enabling people to move um, from poverty uh, to, to, to livelihoods that are better. And so the government established uh, two very important uh, legal instruments. And the one of them is the Employment Equity and Transformation Act. I think if you're not living in South Africa, it's difficult to understand. But if you've been reading our history, you'll understand why it's so important for us to legislate. Because we believe the best way of undoing the evils of apartheid is to undo the legislations that supported and strengthened apartheid and put in place legislations that uh, promote inclusion. But it is also 
critical that following those legislations, there are instruments for monitoring and reporting so that you don't just end up with a legislation that nobody obeys. And so the Employment Equity and Transformation Act makes it mandatory for institutions to report annually on statistics and gives, uh, give, give uh, uh, a monitoring report that indicates what people of a certain race are appointed at what level, how many people living with dis disabilities are appointed at what level, how many males and females are appointed at what level. And the government believes strongly that it is its responsibility to monitor what the organizations do so that the, the act is put into, into being and it's not left to the goodwill of CEOs just to write the plan. So writing the plan itself is not sufficient. It is monitored and it is reported. And there is a penalty for non-compliance. And so in many institutions in higher education, the monitoring of the act sits with the principal's office, with the vice chancellor's office. And he becomes or she becomes the accountable officer and if there isn't compliance to the targets that they set or to the in, uh, national targets, the, 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 the vice chancellor is then held liable. And in the private sector, the CEO is then held li liable and there is a penalty. It is sad though to, to, to say that there are some organizations in the private sector that will budget for the penalty. And we find it sad that there are people in this day and age who are still willing to continue discrimination and pay their way through, um, and pay the penalty for non-compliance. But in higher education, and in my university in particular, um, the, the vice chancellor has said to us, that the day he has to pay a fine, heads will roll. And so which means people like myself who head departments have a responsibility to ensure that in our department we are compliant and we don't bring the university to disrepute. And for me, it's a lot more than just the statistics. It's really ensuring that the whole of humanity and, our, and the diversity of humanity enriches our work. So in addition to the Employment Equity and Transformation Act, in higher education, and I'll keep talking about higher education because that's the area where I work and where I can speak um, with confidence, in our education, the, the education-wide paper, which is the instrument that indicates, uh, gives guidance to universities and higher education and schools as well, it is stated again very clearly that inclusivity in schools, in buildings, in services is mandatory. And again, education institutions are monitored for compliance to the education white paper. And there's a penalty for non-compliance. It almost sounds like a police state, but, but it is not. There is a responsibility of ensuring that your democracy works and, that, and ensuring that in order to effect re redress, those that stand in the way of redress are made to pay. Within the institution, because there is a national, a national um, instrument and national guidelines, universities make it an effort to comply. But my university makes an effort to go beyond just complying. And, and I will talk about it just a little bit. Those beautiful bright lights are my university, the University of South Africa. It sits on, on one of the five hills around Pretoria. And um, we say that uh, it's, 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 it's a gateway into Pretoria because as you're coming in from the airport, it's the first structure that you see on your right. And it is the only dedicated uh, distance learning university. Our mission is to, to, to be the African university in service to humanity. And we often say that it's this great vision, rather our vision, is this great vision that makes us come up the hill every morning. We, we're working towards being the African University 
in service to humanity. And we take our African mandate very seriously. Over the years, the institution has developed uh, what we called a social mandate. Access to our university is not limited to certain strict academic qualifications. There is general instruments that the, that, the, that the minister gives that you must have passed high school in order to go to university. And, and we, we, we comply to that. But if you did not pass well high school and you'd like to go to university, we provide access to higher education by providing an access program that will enable you to, 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 pack, to earn certain credits and then go into university. So we see our open access, our mandate is increasing access to higher education, particularly for previously disadvantaged uh, groups of people. We are secondly committed to delivering high quality education wherever, wherever people are. And so we don't just provide access to higher education, but we ensure that it is high quality. And because our country is such a, is such a big um, uh, country, the open and distance learning mode that we use seeks to bring the education to you. So that you don't have to leave work. If you are a woman who has got children, you can bring up your children as well as work on your degree. If you are a person living with disabilities and are housebound and can't get out, you can study and we'll bring the materials to you. Thirdly, we seek to remove barriers due to distance, technology, isolation and disability by bringing education to you. And fourthly, to utilize all means possible to deliver knowledge, regardless of where you are, regardless of um, your technology, regardless of your space. And this is very important for us because, as you know, South Africa has four worlds in one. There's a first world, high tech, and a whole range to a fourth world with no electricity, no running water, no running sewage. And the University of South Africa seeks to provide education across those four worlds. In compliance with the, with the government uh, instruments, but also because of that vision, as well as the social mandate that we have set for ourselves, we've included in our strategic plan, but annually in our institutional operational plan, we include in goal five, create an enabling environment for persons living with disability. And these may be students, but also including staff. We've also crafted an employment equity and transformation plan, which seeks to support the university's commitment to diversity as a source of human excellence. We, we've often said that history roped us in South Africa by judging people and their abilities based on what they look like. And the commitment of all the post-apartheid governments has been to reverse that. That people's abilities are more than whether they sit on a wheelchair, whether they are tall, or whether they are short, or whether they have one eye or, or none at all, but their abilities are deeper than what you see of them. And in our employment equity plan and transformation plan, we seek to enhance humanity regardless of what the person looks like. Black, white, yellow, short, eyes, no eyes, no ears, no hair. Important thing, you are a human being, what can you bring to the table? And the, the, the vice chancellor's office monitors the performance of each department against that. And so each department must produce um, an employment equity report 
at the end of each year and say what its targets are and how far they've gone against that. And relating specifically to people living with disabilities, the university has established an advocacy and resource center for students with, with disabilities, which does two things mainly. And the first one is to support students at registration. And so at the point of entry, um, we are able to include those students and help them with registration by setting up a separate office. And the advantage of that is it helps us to identify at entry point who is and who is not disabled. And so we can then tailor our services um, accordingly. And so this center then establishes um, a, a database from the beginning of the year of how many students have entered the university or are within the university that are living with disabilities or what kind of disabilities. And secondly, this center has an advocacy and training role. And the training is not only limited to st for students, but also for staff. For example, it gives uh, us um, uh, lessons in sign language, um, does programs on disability awareness, and help the university really respond uh, in, in an equitable manner to people living with disabilities. And even within this univer the university, these colleagues will remind us, nothing for us without us. And so this, this great big university that I keep talking about has many students. And I was saying to, to Marita just uh, now that for many students with disabilities, we've become a, a university of choice. And I'll come back to that just now. We have, we have as you can see, we've had a, a steady growth over, over the years. And this statistics is from the January uh, enrollments, we're 290. Um, and as of the uh, enrollments of, of, of June, our numbers have gone up to 371,000. And, and the reason we grow is not because we like to be big. The reason we grow is because we will provide access to higher education to anybody who wants it. And so some will say, some of the people that you have should not be university material. Who says? Who says who's, who's not university material? You work your way up. Um, and, and your circumstances don't determine where you'll end up. And so at UNISA, we, we open that. And because we do, because we have these many numbers, there is indeed proof that there is a need for reaching people wherever they are. Our students are all over the world. The bulk of them are in South Africa. Uh, 26,000 on the continent is a lot of people. That's a full university there. Uh, in the rest of the world, we reach people. I met somebody the other day who said uh, they, were, they were living in California and they are our student. Um, and, and those who have not provided uh, information of where, where they stay met have just it could, have, it could have been an error, it could be that they were between places, but it's a small number. And so our, our students are really in the global village. The, the vice chancellor that I, I served under uh, when I first got to UNESA five years ago said to us that the, uh, the just go back, said, said to us that each department has a, a responsibility to ensure that it is aligned with all key instruments of the university. And especially those instruments for which he must account to government. And he was a tough man. He's a, a lawyer and a, uh, an Anglican priest an ordained Anglican priest. And, and I said to him once, you, you're a difficult person to please because you only answer to God <laughs> and the law. 
but he's, he's an established human rights activist. He was the chairperson of our human rights board for many years and, and is very committed to issues of human rights and said, this is how we're going to do it. And if as an executive director you fail, you fail in this, um, know that let me receive your, your resignation uh, because you're not taking us forward as a university. And so the library and any other department, for that matter, has make, made sure that we, we, we support the programs that seek, seek to bring transformation to the university and uh, in line with our presentation today, programs that support our disabilities. On the library side, we have established the Library Disability Forum, which is a, a watchdog for our clients uh, with disabilities. And we established it so that the staff had a place where they can get together and discuss what services should we be offering, what are the experiences that, that they're having, how should we be responding to the changing needs of our, of our, of our clients, what are some of the things that um, we should be doing and doing differently. And so uh, a library disability forum was established. We've toyed around with employing staff that are dedicated uh, to serving students with disability. And about a month ago, we, we uh, shelved that idea because we felt that all staff that work in the library must have the skills to deal with um, uh, students with disabilities. So it's not a few selected people, but that all of us can respond to, 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 to the needs of the students because it is not always that only Anna will be in the library or Anna will be in the library when a student walks in. But all of us as library staff must be able to, to respond to the student need, um, whatever it is. So we, we, are, we are working with, the, we've worked over the years with a program of awareness, but we're turning that now into skills, uh, getting lessons in, in sign language, uh, getting lessons in maneuvering wheelchairs, getting lessons in working with equipment, um, different types of equipment. And for those that other disabilities that are not physical, uh, like diabetes, we've made a link between the health and safety part of the library, which includes having uh, a Red Cross and first aiders on each floor together with this forum for disabilities, so that should someone collapse and their machine says, or the chain on their arm says they are diabetic, we know who to call to attend before, before the ambulance arrives. We also offer a certain number of services uh, to, to, the, uh, to our students. The first one is the sign language interpretation that we are all, all learning. I must tell you it's harder than learning French. <laughs> Um, but we're working on it because you're committed to, to learning. But because our skills are not yet perfected, we can use the services of AXWIT, the center, the resource center uh, for students with, with disabilities. Entry to the university is free for students, but if you're bringing in a partner, there is a charge. You get a day pass uh, to come in. But we've waived that, that, that uh, pass for a day pass for uh, people accompanying people with disabilities, you know, your guide, your family member who comes in with you to assist you. We waiver a charge uh, for that. We also don't allow pets uh, in, in the library, but guide dogs are not pets. Uh, they're, they're part of your equipment and they are allowed in. And regardless of what disability you have, ranging um, from those that we can see and those that we can not easily recognize. Uh, once you're listed as being disabled, you get an extended loan period uh, for, for your loaning materials because that means there's something that inhibits your, your actual learning process and therefore we give you more time uh, to use uh, resources. We've got specialized st services for staff that are on wheelchairs, and I will show you a picture of how we are even upping that in the, in the new building as we are busy renovating uh, our old building. Within the library, we also keep wheelchairs because they can be temporary physical disability. Um, if you're diabetic and your sugar has dropped, you'll need help. And so we, we, we keep wheelchairs um, for, for, for those sort of temporary 
um, uh, disabilities. Um, uh, and then a special, special parking close to the library, close to the ramp, um, for staff as well as for, 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 for students. We've increased in our e-collections uh, because we find that it's, it's a lot easier to, to, to translate those into, into languages um, that people with disabilities use. Um, and we try and use as much of the mobile technology so that, again, because we're a distance learning institution, that the persons don't come to the library for interventions. And I'll speak specifically about the technologies we've uh, invested in. In addition to the lessons that we get from Axwit on sign language, we've also invested in, in Sign Genius, which is a, a set of, of, of video clips to learn sign languages. Um, and for us in South Africa, it's a challenge because uh, of our many languages. Um, and, and, and so we, uh, Unfortunately, at this stage, it's translating from English and Afrikaans. But most people work with those two languages because there's the languages of the marketplace. And we, we all are working at, at learning uh, the, the sign language. We've also uh, invested in uh, uh, something called Easy Converter. But in addition to all those things that it can do, converts print to text, converts text to MP3, DAISY, Braille, and large print, we've also invested in paying for that. Because while there is exceptions in the, in the copyright law in the country for, for services for people with disability, we have a challenge of numbers. We have over 1,500 students that are uh, sight impaired. And because of the many translations that we do into, the, into those different languages, the, the, the rights organizations um, decided that we would have to pay for some of the conversions um, because it, it's, a, it's too much. But we're negotiating with them that it should really, volume should, should not be the issue. If, if there is uh, exceptions allowed for education, volume should not matter. It's human beings for whom we need to provide a service and do need to translate that text uh, into, into MP3, into DAISY, into Braille, in order that they may learn. We've also invested in several dolphin pens and we loan these out to, to, to students and, and try to ensure that it, at, at our centers, um, the students can work with this dolphin pen um, so that then again they are able to uh, uh, download uh, uh, software that they need, that they need to use into a, into a dolphin enabled uh, PC. It's a huge investment for us uh, as, as a library, but again, because our IOP uh, our organizational operational plan has committed itself to providing a service and creating an environment for people with disabilities to learn. We have to, 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 to fund uh, that commitment. A number of other um, instruments we have, we have uh, invested in uh, the, 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 the Merlin desktop magnifier is for people who are partially sighted and it enlarges the, the page that you can, you can uh, read. Uh, uh, the, the, the book reader that you see is, is in audio. It will read and then it will be um, in audio, but also can translate it uh, if you get another software into Braille as well. We, we recently had a, uh, an audit, and, and one of the things that were being audited was uh, our services for students with disabilities and Murphy's Law that morning the scanner didn't work. <laughs> Fortunately, students vouched for us that it always works. <laughs> a number of other uh, technologies that we've invested in, and as you can see, a lot of them are mobile, 
because we learn them out, we loan them out to students, and they can use them uh, at their homes. Um, the book, uh, book courier, the audio book player, um, and we buy quite a lot of audio books. And the ones which we don't buy, but that are only in, available in print, the tools um, convert them to audio, so that then they can be played, played back. Uh, the book sense and the classmate player. I was saying earlier that for many of us students with disabilities, we've become a university of choice. And that is because of these sort of services that we bring. Firstly, if, if we have many complications that, um, or you have a, di a, a disability that makes you embarrassed to be out in public, and there are many forms, you know, maybe severe deformity, and maybe you've, you've had chemo and you've lost all your hair and you don't really want to go out, uh, out, out there. Because we bring the service to you and, and this, we become a university that enables you to learn whatever your condition, I condition is. For, for many students who are uh, on, on wheelchairs where it is difficult to get around um, uh, a university, it is a lot easier to learn from home. And so we become a university of choice. But then what goes with that responsibility is being able to invest in these sort of technologies that enable people to learn by converting what is largely um, print text into formats that can be used. The iPal uh, scans print and converts it to text or sends it to Braille or displays it for the blind uh, and the deaf blind. This is a very recent acquisition, um, but it works faster than any of our other technologies and is loved by our younger readers because it is fast. But it's only at disadvantage is that only one person can use it at a time and, and we can't keep the, the text but we are working on a way of ensuring that um, the student can take their bit, but if it is a course that, is, that they are doing and there are other students with similar disabilities, we can take from that conversion and keep the file for other students with similar disabilities. So that we are not scanning the same document over and over again, but can make it then available to other readers um, that, have, that have similar. Uh, disabilities. You've probably all seen this Zoom text um, keyboard uh, that it has got raised uh, key, uh, keypads. Again, it makes it easier for people that are living, uh, that, that are hearing sight impaired to work with because the keyboard, the keypad is raised and it is large and bright uh, and, and that. And this is my favorite picture of our favorite student, uh, Shepard. He's in the library every day in the morning um, and he's doing a master's. And he sits there at his desk. He's our greatest uh, uh, ambassador for the services that we bring. And we've often said to Shepard, you know, we can bring these things to, to for you at home. But Shepard comes to us because he doesn't have electricity at home. And he's overcome, he's totally blind. Um, he's doing his master's, and he says if there wasn't this technology, he wouldn't be where he is. And, and, and it's, it's one of my favorite pictures, and, and for me, he says, gives me a reason to get up the hill every morning. Uh, again, that's um, a workstation with a raised uh, keypad. What I also wanted to show was that the, the workstations, we've invested in workstations that allow not only for, um, uh, for students with disabilities like that, but also workstations that allow for wheelchairs. So most of our disability workstations are huge and you can wheel in a, a, a wheelchair and work comfortably. This is what I said earlier that we, we ordinarily give uh, people 30 days uh, to borrow books, but for people living with disabilities, it's 42. It's 42 days, and we can extend it depending on where you're located, what your circumstances are, because uh, you, requ you, you require the service. 
In the new building, we're working on a new building, we're basically gutting uh, our eight floors uh, to get um, uh, services, uh, more service. And you'll see that the, the bottom picture shows uh, a wheelchair and we're having a lot more rooms, uh, spaces that are going to be uh, wheelchair friendly and much more accessible um, to, to readers and they'll, they'll be at level two. So it's easy to go from the car parking lot into this work area. Um, and we're really excited that we could have this, this service expanded uh, in the new building that we're having. Our library is committed uh, to inclusiveness. As you can see in this, in this recent uh, Celebration and Library Week, develop at your library that even with students that are living with disabilities, we are really committed to ensuring that human development is possible within our library. And in conclusion, University of South Africa is committed to bringing a knowledge and creating knowledge for all communities regardless of uh, your physical condition or um, uh, your disability. Inclusion is central to UNISA services, not only in order to comply to, to the government uh, instruments, but our vision compels us that we, we do that. Ensuring equal access to learning content, regardless of your ability or disability, and we invest in those gadgets that I've talked about in order to ensure that you've got access to learning content. Our social mandate demands it of each one of us who works at UNISA, and our vision compels us to do it. I thank you very much for your attention and for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, perhaps um, there are some questions that, um, that you'd like to, to ask. And so why don't I just leave you? Thank you. Um, you, you if you'll pardon me, I'll say, I'll say yes, because I don't know your names. Please. If. Yes. Oh, all right. Let me repeat the question. The first one was about uh, a disability diagnosis. Does the university have a mechanism for diagnosing? Uh, and the second one is, is about resurgence of polio and to what extent we are experiencing that in South Africa. Usually the disabilities, learning disabilities are diagnosed in high school and primary school. By the time they come to university, they are labeled. Um, uh, uh, or they've been diagnosed. And so, and I use labeled because some students feel labeled, um, 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 yes, ADD or, or, or whatever, and then respond. But some take it as have been diagnosed. And so we report, I've got this challenge, and, and, the, and the university simply responds to the diagnosis. We don't do a test, but we have the AXWIT helps us if there is a student who's failing to, to cope to help them to get diagnosed. So the university doesn't provide the diagnosis. Ax, what AXWIT also does is to help the university staff, train university staff to respond. Um, how do you respond to ADT students? How do you respond to this? And, and so they provide the training for the staff in order to, re, in how to respond, because it's difficult. Polio, there's a resurgence all over the world, and four years ago, even before that, 
the Minister of Health, Nkosa Zanazuma, had a very aggressive approach to vaccinations and um, vaccinated people be below a certain age. So we haven't seen an increase in disabilities within South Africa due to polio because of the very aggressive intervention of um, uh, um, um, vaccinations against polio. But indeed there's a, there is a, a resurgence on the continent. There was another, I'm going lengthwise, I mean this way, wise, clockwise, clockwise? Yes. Is the primary incentive for disability services in the university, or are there other people like you in other areas of the, of the university doing the same function? The, the, the university has established AXUIT, we call it AXUIT, for the, which is the Center for uh, Students Living with Disabilities. Um, and theoretically, there should be a lot of us like me doing different things in different, in different parts. But because of the nature of our university, between registration and exams, what most students have is the library. Their interaction with their supervisors are largely online or by post or on the phone. But the library is the reality of most students. And so I always joke about, yeah, okay, we'll register as many as we can, and between exams and registration, I get all 370,000 of them. So, so we, we've had to be active because we then must deal with this registered 1,600 students living with disabilities, whereas the College of Law only deals with 50, and the College of Human Sciences deals with 25. And the college of, and we deal with the bulk of them. So we've had to be to be active. And and, and Axwit says if only all departments were like us. But it's not because we want to be good. It's because we have no option but to do this, in order to provide a learning content to to, to, to all our students. Yeah. Um, but but all you all 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 departments must comply to goal number five which is creating an atmosphere for students living with disabilities, learning atmosphere for students living with disabilities. So there's a, there's a mandatory uh, requirement for everybody to be like that. We've just done a little bit more because we must, we must they are here, they're on our doorstep. Yeah. And to you, Peggy. Uh, yes, again, thank you very much for a very, very informative, very interesting presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, since you're identifying new forms of disabilities, you know, as your list is increasing and as you were saying, is there a research part of the university that is creating, let's say, new technology? You are showing us some very interesting uh, items that were used to transfer, you know, uh, text to sound, to audio, and, and others. Um, as the disabilities list is increasing, do you have within the library, uh, within the university, a research department that is creating new technology, that is using uh, the people's own statements of what they need, as you were saying earlier, you know, we need to have people's input, uh, that is working on, on developing uh, I thank you for that question. It's really something that we ought to be doing. But we are not doing that. We're buying the technology. <laughs> yes, we, we, we buy the technology um, because it's easier. <laughs> but the, 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 the center for uh, Axwit, the Center for Students Living with Disabilities, helps us to identify the technologies and helps us to, um, to keep track of what new, of what is new, what, what has been researched elsewhere, what has been, uh, precisely because it's, it keeps emerging. There are some people who are focusing on research and discovering and, and doing this. And at this stage, what we're doing is buying from them. Um, it's a lot easier and a lot, a lot quicker for us. Yeah. Yeah. But the scanning of the horizon is done for us by the Disability um, Center. Yeah. I hope that, that helps. Yeah.
Yes, that's president. I think a person like Shepard is so determined, he will make you pay, whoever you are. <laughs> He's such a, so determined to go forward. But the, the government has put aside a bursary scheme uh, for people that are, are, are disabled and different tiers of that, I mean, disadvantaged, and different tiers of disadvantage get uh, certain portions of government support. The university also gives scholarship. Um, uh, to, to assist uh, students that are deserving, um, like Shepherd, and, and many kinds of, 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 of assistance there. I think the university's commitment is expressed in so many different ways. We had recently a colleague who had a condition that ate away at their psychomotor system, and they lost ability to use their hands and eyes and within three years, you know, um, from an able man to um, all that was left was voice. And when he retired, uh, the university let him take the equipment he was using to continue using. So we, we follow through with our investment. Um, it costs us money, but there are some prizes we're willing to pay because we are committed to, to, to the vision. And the government is also very committed. And it must be seen to put its money towards ins ins instruments. So students with disabilities like Shepherd uh, get get assistance um, from 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 the university. Uh, Levy? I just wonder, during the era of apartheid, was the university open to all races, or was it restricted at that time? Essentially, distance learning. Um, university. Uh, People didn't have a physical presence anyway. So I'm just, just wondering if there was segregation at that time. Okay. The university provided education for people across races, but black people didn't come to graduation. It provided opportunity for learning for people that were on Robin Island. So a lot of people who were in detention in Robin Island, like Nelson Mandela, um, got their degrees from UNISA but the uh, black people would not come for graduation ceremonies. Um, when things were relaxed a little bit in the 90s, they would come to separate graduations. Um, uh, to the extent that um, after 1994, uh, uh, there was a special graduation ceremony for people who had been on Robin Island, and a series of graduation ceremonies for people who had been on Robin Island, and for people who had got their degrees from UNESA, but they had not walked uh, across the platform uh, in graduation, um, again, in an our attempt to redress. Uh, it is sad, it, it is our sad history that we, continue, we did provide education um, to people, but we would not let them celebrate their success uh, through graduation. And during apartheid days, again, the entrance requirement was stricter. It, it wasn't as open as, as it is now. Um, the, the entrance requirements were stricter. They still had lots of people uh, uh, registering because the fees were slightly lower. Many black people could afford the fees, but with the, with the knowledge that you will not celebrate your success with graduation. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I would just like to add something, because we are here at the Library of Congress and because we are always increasing the, the, the knowledge base here, the publications that we have. We have material here at the library on, on um, 
disabilities in South Africa. We have uh, we, we have text uh, related to law relating to laws. We I, I notice the the use of terms inclusiveness as opposed to maybe crippled, and and it's it's interesting looking at the subject headings. And so for researchers who have an interest in this subject, come to the library. We have material on it as well as going to South African libraries for additional information. But thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Bule and Bambatata, for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.